This is Erin Balsa from House of Bald, and you're listening to the Notorious Thought Leader Podcast. My guest today is Evan Balin, who's CEO at First Page Sage. Thanks for being here today, Evan. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. Of course. I'm so excited to chat. So the reason I wanted to have you on is that you have built the largest SEO firm in the United States with clients like Microsoft and Salesforce, which is obviously super cool. But I really want to have you on because I see that you describe your company as an SEO firm that specializes in thought leadership marketing. And I'm really interested in learning about how you weave together SEO and thought leadership in your client content strategies. But first, I'm going to start by asking you the same question that I ask every guest who comes on this show. And that is, in your view, what is thought leadership? Okay, I think of thought leadership as a age old concept. It's essentially when you share either on your individual behalf or on a business's behalf, insights that are valuable to an audience. And because you share those insights, it makes others want to follow you or work with your business, essentially be associated with you. And I think that you could find, you could call something as early as Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, even before that Confucius, a a form of thought leadership. Somebody is in the forum and uh, sharing wise ideas. And uh, if there was something for them to sell, then people would have been happy to buy it because they've developed trust because these individuals are sharing uh, valuable ideas. And so sharing valuable ideas and building trust that way turns out to be an excellent way to conduct business. A word that you used prior to this call, we were talking about influence, and that is a word that you use to describe thought leadership. So thinking about you know adjectives that really get to the heart of what it means to be a thought leader, what would those kind of words or adjectives really mean? Like what characterizes a person who can be seen by others as a thought leader? Probably uh, credible, interesting, valuable. We are in an economy of ideas in many ways where it's not as much the way it was decades ago where a physical good is going to be as much value as an idea, especially in the world of software companies, SaaS businesses. People are looking for ways to do things better and to think about the operations of their company more intelligently, think about marketing in a brighter way. And so thought leadership uh, really is making yourself more valuable so that others seek to uh, take some of that value for themselves. So that's why I come up with valuable. Credible is just getting to that minimum standard of someone saying, this is a business I could work with. And I think thought leadership definitely does that because it says we have good ideas and we are trusted by other organizations. That's often part of thought leadership. And I say interesting because uh, like I said before, when you have ideas that seem unique, that's tough to find nowadays. I think that there are lots of ideas that are essentially recycled, even phrases. You hear a lot of people say the same phrases because they heard it at a conference or they read it in a book. Every idea is in some way derivative, but if you can say something in an original way or format it in a way, package it in a way it has, hasn't been done before, people find a tremendous value in that and not many people are doing it. Yeah, it really is hard to come up with a completely original idea. It's kind of like a movie or a song, right? There's always some build on. You're not just pulling it out of thin air. There's always some sort of foundation that you're building upon. You know, I'm kind of thinking a lot about credibility because that's a common word that's coming up a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, one of the questions I asked you, one of the yes or no rapid fire questions Mm -hmm. was, do you have to be a subject matter expert to be a thought leader. And I said, don't think about it too hard. Give one second to think and then give the answer. And you had said no. So how do you kind of come to terms with being credible without being a thought leader expert? So credibility is in the eye of the beholder, of course, to some people, whoever you are, you know, you're credible to others. You are not credible. It really depends on their perspective and their, their needs and what angle of you they see online, in person, whatever the social uh, you know, kind of medium is. So I think credibility often comes down to people getting a repetition of either your face or your name or something like that. If they see you talking a lot, then you become more credible, which doesn't make logical sense, but it, it is a, a truth of marketing. 
Then, of course, when they read what you have to say or listen to it on a video or listen to it on a podcast, whatever it is, if they find themselves kind of nodding and say, that's actually a good point. I haven't thought of it that way. That is uh, the combination that you need. So it's, it's actual insights or intelligent or original thoughts combined with repetition, I think, builds credibility. And you don't need to be a subject matter expert, although, of course, it's great to be that and it makes it more effortless. If you simply are very capable of thinking in an original way, and really like just thinking at all is what's needed. And I mean, deep thinking, because of course we're always thinking, but the way that I personally create original content is I think about the concept that I want to write about that I think is interesting. And in my world of SEO, it's often keyword driven. I know the keyword that I want to rank for. And then I think about what the searcher would be interested in. And I think about what people have said about the subject. And then I just go through testing it. Do I agree with that? Do I disagree with that? And I don't allow myself to write what comes to, the, to my mind immediately. I stop and I just really ponder for a while. And then always the result of that is something original. Even if I use words other people have, because I really stopped to think about it rather than went from my immediate reaction, my immediate impulse, which is probably recycling something that I just heard or read you know, in the last few months or years, it tends to really be felt by the, the audience as an original conception. And I think that simple idea is what makes things more credible. I love that. That's such an important point, right? A lot of people just don't know how to start. They feel like very time constraints. And I'm talking about a lot of content creators in-house or otherwise. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of work on your plate and they just kind of go through the motions a lot of times and bang it out. And they're going to use their search tools. And it says you have to use these 25 keywords and you have to use this one two times and this one three times. And you end up coming up with something that is exactly like anything else that is on page one or two or three. So I really love that you're, you know, starting with a keyword in mind or a topic. Would you say you start thinking about a keyword, like a specific long tail keyword or just more of a topic that you want to speak to? I'm glad you asked because I really want to make a hard distinction here. Never a topic, always a keyword. Okay. And the reason that I, you know, say it in such a, a strong way is because it's one of those mistakes that it is easy to make for years, I would say, even SEO companies, where they say, well, let's think about a topic that would be valuable to your audience. There are many topics that would be valuable to your audience that they didn't think to search for, or they wouldn't think to search for, or that they would think to search for, but just using different words than mm. your topic might, might bring up. So you actually have to think about the ways that people input words into the search box on Google when they are searching for things that would be commercially valuable. Mm -hmm. You really have to put each, you have to select keywords rather than topics and then put each keyword through the test of, is this commercially valuable? Whatever the implication is behind the keyword, what, what the person was thinking, what they really meant, would that draw them to buy from your business eventually? It doesn't have to be an immediate transactional word, but it could be someone's in a decision-making or an evaluative stage. Mm -hmm. And would that be valuable? And then do you already rank for it? Can you rank for it? Or is it like ridiculously competitive or something like that? So those are an example. Those are three tests that you would put a keyword through. But not only do you start with the keyword, you have to test it rigorously using several tests, including those three. And then you have to say, how do I create the best piece of content on the internet? Answering the question, inherent in the user's mind when they typed in that search. And I don't say it lightly when I say that the best response on the internet, because there's only one number one result. It was a meritocracy. So it truly is a medium if there ever has been one, wherein you have to create the best. Excellence is a principle that is you know, paramount. I don't know if you've seen this like I have, but there's been a lot of conversations over the last year or two online about the shift away from trying to rank for keywords and trying to rank instead for topics. And clearly you disagree with that and you've built a very successful business with what you know and what you do. So what do you think is going on there? Why are people starting to move away from keywords and they're trying to rank for more topics? What, do you know what's going on there? Have you have any insight into that? Well, I hope nobody does that because it doesn't make sense because Google doesn't have a topically based search engine. They have a keyword based search engine where you type in a keyword and it looks through all the pages on the internet that have that keyword in the title tag and then it ranks them based on the quality of the content in the search in the web pages as well as the relevance to the, to the keyword and the search intent behind the keyword. I think what you may be referring to though is the fact that Google is does give more credibility to websites that display what I call niche expertise. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, there's topical expertise if you're 
writing about digital transformation or something like that. You'd have a, a big organizing page or a topical page that is often referred to as a hub. And then around the hub, you have other pages. And those pages are linked from that hub page. And it would be like digital transformation KPIs, digital transformation strategies. And you might have 20 keywords that are linked from that page. Those keywords, or excuse me, they're links that go to separate pages that each target their own keyword. That's a long tail version of digital transformation. So that would be a keyword cluster page or a hub page. And in that way, you would show Google that you're more topically relevant and be able to rank higher for keywords. So it still ends in ranking for keywords, but you're using topics or you know niche expertise, as I like to call it, in order to outrank your competitors. Right. I think it was HubSpot that came up with the hub and spoke model. What, yes. like, probably like eight or nine years ago. It's definitely been around for a while. Yeah, I think I call it around 2011, but it's been around a while and it was prescient of them. And I think it's the modern era of SEO, Hub and Spoke, conceived by them, as you say. And I think what reading between the lines with what you're saying, and I, you know, the Hub and Spoke model combined with the fact that there's a lot of misinformation floating around online, right? And especially if you spend a lot of time in communities and on social media, there's a lot of people who start doing something and five months later, they're teaching others. And I think maybe that's why this whole shift is happening. And people are saying like, don't worry about keywords, just rank for topics. And I think that it's a good thing for us to clear up for the people that are listening. You know, keywords do still matter. That's just the way that Google is these days. I remember when I was learning about SEO, I did not start nearly as early as you did. Mm -hmm. But I first started learning about it probably like around 2010 or so. And mm -hmm. I remember the way it was described to me, which relates exactly to what you were saying. You can't assume you know how people are going to search for things, right? So the way it was explained to me originally was, I sell jar candles. You know, like those Yankee candles, they call them yeah. house warmer candles. So mm -hmm. I'm going to go create all this content and put some paid traffic toward the keyword house warmer candles. Oh, wait, nobody's buying these candles. Nobody's looking at these pages. Well, nobody's looking for them. They're looking for oversized candles or jar candles. They're not calling them house warmer candles, right? So right. how do you you know, recommend that people go about understanding how people are, are searching rather than just assuming that they know what people are searching for? Yeah, so there's a few different ways to do keyword research. I have a little bit of a less traditional way that I advocate because it promotes more exploration because a lot of this is just about like investment and risk. Like you invest in a keyword that's long tail that doesn't have much search volume saying, I think I can rank for this. And I think more people search for this than I can find data on as far as search volume. So the Google AdWords keyword suggestion tool is the most popular free tool. I would say that'll give you keyword suggestions. And then uh, Moz has a tool, I think SEMrush, Ahrefs, all have some level of tool that you can use. I personally prefer, and not everybody can do this, but I prefer to just go to Google and start typing in keywords that you think your audience would search and then just go through it. And it wouldn't be one person doing this. You need a few different minds in the room. And you'd say, you know what? Our customers, would they search by industry? Would they search by like referring to themselves as a certain type of customer? You know, like in HVAC or something, somebody might look for like residential HVAC company or something. So it's like the company type, or it could be like a hospital HVAC, a hospital wants a specialist just, or an HVAC, they want an HVAC company that just does healthcare or large, you know, institutions like a hospital. And you just kind of need to go through and have a little bit of familiarity with the different dimensions along with pe along which uh, people search and you'll end up finding gold. I mean, it's, it's like a treasure hunt. Because Google will, of course, suggest to you keywords in the search box, and they'll do it in order of search volume. So you know if the keyword that you see that seems like a potential good keyword shows up in a drop-down list of 10, it means it has at least somewhat substantial search volume. You can type in anything, you know, taking like digital transformation, you can type in like digital transformation and start typing in monkey and it'll autofill that for you. So it's a mistake a lot of people make. You want to put, you know, just in digital transformation or HVAC contract or whatever it may be, and then uh, just wait to see what comes up. And if there's a drop down list of 10, that means there's search volume and, and that would be a reasonable keyword to target. So that's the way that I like 
to do it. It takes some experience. It takes some debate in the room. Some people mm -hmm. saying, you know, I don't think people look that way. When someone types this in, that's not what they really mean. That's more of a researcher. That's not a real potential customer. I think that it's maybe more advanced, but that is truly the way that find your best keywords. That's so interesting. And, you know, something that I've had a hard time wrapping my own head around, and I'd love to chat about with you. Yeah. You know, there's kind of, well, there's obviously a huge need to answer searcher intent, right? So if I'm searching for jar candles, I, maybe I want to learn about the ingredients, but probably not. I probably want to buy them because if I wanted to learn about the ingredients, I probably would have used a different search query, you know? So searcher intent is so important for ranking if you're trying to get your content to rank. But then on the other hand, a lot of thought leadership, as we've said, are these kind of new ideas, maybe not net new, maybe you're building on things that exist and you're finding your own unique way to agree or disagree. Or maybe it is a really truly new framework or a new discipline. I know a lot of clients are creating new categories and new disciplines. So maybe it truly is something that is more new. People don't know that these new disciplines or these new categories exist. So they're not searching for them by name, right? So how do you move forward with that when you're trying to get a keyword and satisfy intent, but your thought leadership is this new stuff that people are saying, wow, I never thought about things that way. Like, how do you do both? Yes. Yeah, so there's two ways to think about it. If you want to do it through SEO, which is always tricky. How do you target keywords when people aren't looking for those keywords yet because they don't know that the product or, or the concept uh, of what you do exists? You would have to target other keywords that indicate that the searcher has a problem that would lead them to the solution that you now have and introduce them to the solution. So they're sort of uh, getting something they didn't expect. They're searching based around, and there's a lot of problem related searches or question searches, that sort of thing. And you would say, guess what? Th this solution actually exists and many people turn to it and here's why it's good. So that's one thing. The other thing is that I talk about SEO because I have seen the value of it and the ROI of it being higher than any other channel that's not like, you know, in-person contact speeches or direct referral. That's why I like it. However, there's a strong role for social media and email not as new lead generation channels, but as lead nurturing channels and a place to connect with people that already know about your brand. Those would be excellent channels to talk about something topical where you don't really need a keyword. Keywords are there for SEO. Mm -hmm. But if you're posting something on Twitter or LinkedIn, or if you're sending out an email, now it's all about what's going to get people's attention, hopefully not in some cheap attention grabbing way, but it's, it's about, are you going to get people to open the email or to read what you have to say? That's where you can write about anything that's going to interest people and keep their attention. And it's about the art of good writing, being succinct, not being cliched and mm -hmm. uh, storytelling and, and all those things start to matter a lot more. I mean, it's like the world of marketing is of course, much bigger than, than SEO. And, and it would be a great place to say like, you know, introducing this concept, if you have this problem or if you have this need, there's a new way of doing things. I love that. Something that we did in our in my last job when I uh, was a marketing director at the Predictive Index, we had come up with a new discipline, a new category called talent optimization. No one has ever heard of that. No one's searching for it, right? So, right, right. and search was a, a big channel for us. We did pretty well with our with our search, and we did a nice series of blog posts. And it was like how to hire a top performing BDR, how to hire a top performing whatever job title that had some good search volume. And it was a really helpful article that completely answered the problem and then introduced this new way of using behavioral people data to, you know, match the person to the job target so that, you know, you can start to do this thing called talent optimization. You're not going to explain it. You're not going to define it. You're just going to kind of make this new way known, right? And then mm -hmm. hopefully those people are going to click through to some more content or, you know, opt into the newsletter or maybe not, maybe they're just going to remember you. And then the mm -hmm. next time they're online and they, you know, see some content, maybe they read something else, or maybe they consume a native social. And that, like you said, is about the nurturing. I know some people hate the word nurture because like, you're not necessarily always in control of how people prefer to consume content and you're not always going to dictate their journey. People mm -hmm. bounce around. You just have to have the right content in the right places where they are most likely to be, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I'd say it would be to your disadvantage to hate the concept of nurturing and marketing. Maybe the word 
became cliched at some point. I'm not sure. It's not to me, but I just had an experience this morning where I, I bought a, a table and I didn't buy it because like I was searching and saw it. I did. I searched around. I saw it on Google images. I clicked around. I looked at it and then Google started retargeting me and it retargeted me with something that was like a video of this guy talking about the table. It was a video of him like finishing this table. And then I, I just clicked on it because I was like, I just saw that. That's so funny, which is not funny. It was very intentional. <laughs> Even though I'm in marketing, I still was like, because I'm like very interested in like, I have this space in my home. I really want this table there. And then I just watched the video for like two minutes of this guy putting like all this care into this table. And then I was on the phone with him a few minutes later buying it. And the initial search, it was not the close. The initial search was just enough to get me to keep it somewhere in my mind. I was off to other tables, other websites. The nurturing is what closed me. Mm. So big fan of, of the nurturing side, even though SEO is only one part of that picture and email and social, I think, are the big nurturing channels. That's awesome. And that's not what people traditionally think of when they think of nurturing, right? People's head just goes to nurture, blog, newsletter, sale. Mm -hmm. And that's just you know, barely scratching the surface. So speaking right. about these different ways that you can nurture and deliver thoughts, thought leadership, mm -hmm. what are your preferred kind of channels or go-tos? I know I had asked you, I ask everybody this, is the stage the ultimate place for thought leadership? And I believe that you had said yes. And I'd love to kind of talk about that too. I know you're all about content. I am too, but I think bigger than just content. I think about marketing strategy, right? So how does that all come together for you and your clients? Well, I think almost every company needs a multi-channel strategy. I think SaaS can get away with a lot in terms of like mostly SEO. Maybe you start with some paid advertising until you can build enough trust with Google so that your organic campaigns, your SEO are going, especially B2B SaaS. But you want to be seen in multiple places because people are, you know, if it's a B2B business, you're probably on LinkedIn some of the time. I and mean, of course you search Google because everybody's looking on Google. And then if you happen to read a book, listen to a podcast or go to a conference and see that company, then it's just in, in a psychological way, you're just like putting these things together. Oh, I know that brand. I just saw them. Something about, I just saw them makes it's the credibility I talked about. It's a feeling of comfort with the brand. And now you need to hear something that's of interest and that's going to be stimulating. I think that the in-person channel is the best one, particularly if you're selling a product that is more expensive. If you're selling t-shirts, it obviously is not the channel, but if you're in the B2B world or you're selling some sort of high-end uh, consulting or, or something like that, then there's something about being there in person that uh, increases people's trust. When you make a statement or you say something in person, if you're being authentic, People feel a lot more trust than if you say it virtually. I mean, it's amazing how much can be done virtually. We've all learned that recently, but that's great for reach and for getting that first touch and familiarity. If you can meet with people in person, there is absolutely nothing like it in terms of making them feel a greater sense of trust that they can move forward and, and work with your company. So multi-channel, but still a big fan of, of in-person, even though you wouldn't, you wouldn't think it given my profession is all about Google. Hey, you like to surprise people, keep them on your toes, right? <laughs> well, I see what works. I mean, I, my main interest in it is in what's going to generate revenue for companies because that's what clients need. It's what they pay you for. Yeah, exactly. They're not paying for, you know, high rankings even. It's like the rankings have to be for keywords that are valuable that then cause qualified leads to come in that then close. And if they do it solely through SEO and, and thought leadership and some other complementary channels, like I said, email and social, then great. But however it comes in, it needs to result in revenue on the other side. Mm. So something you do that I think is really interesting is that you employ industry thought leaders and they are creating content multiple times per week on behalf of your different clients, right? So can yes. you tell me a bit about how that works and why you chose to employ thought leaders as opposed to any old writer who writes on any old niche? The goal that I mentioned before is creating the best piece of content on the internet for a keyword that would drive revenue ultimately, that would bring, bring a, a prospective customer. So if you're going to do that, you can't really have a generalist because the problem is there's been blogs and content creation that has been in vogue, I would say, since 2007, maybe 2006, something like that, where it's like every site now has a blog. 
and the internet is saturated with content. So there is an almost 100% uh, probability that there is a well-written, good spelling and grammar, reasonably persuasive article out there on the subject you're going to write about. So you simply can't produce yet another one of them, or you will end up as number like 32 on Google, which mm -hmm. is useless. So how do you get to number one? That's when it comes down to, well, you need a thought leader. I mean, a subject matter expert, I should say even more than a, a thought leader, because you can piece uh, out the work. And that's what we do in our company. That's that's kind of our model that it took years to get to. But essentially, you have somebody that really understands the, the facts of what you're writing about. And then you have somebody that knows how to articulate well. And that could be more of a generalist writer. Uh, the two work together to create a really compelling piece. Then there's a strategist that uh, is thinking about the SEO portion, which is mostly how do you make this a really great article? They are saying, okay, I want you to make this paragraph into a table or into a pie chart or something like that. And then there's a graphic designer that we would bring in as well. That's four different people creating a piece. The uh, subject matter expert is absolutely critical because you need to have the insights. Even if, if you just record a phone call, you have a 30 minute phone call or something like that, and they just give you the insights that you need. If that can then be articulated by someone that's good at that, because having insights and articulating them well are two very separate things. Mm -hmm. And then someone can uh, illustrate them graphically and someone comes up with the idea of illustrating them graphically or expressing them in a way that will rank highly because people will get a lot of value out of it. Now you have the dream team mm -hmm. and you can rank you can rank number one because you actually can create the most satisfying piece of content. I love that you have a whole extended team thinking about this together, right? I also just want to be clear. I think I might have misspoke and I don't want to put any words in your mouth. I think I might have said you hire thought leaders. I meant to say, if I didn't say it, you hire subject matter experts to create mm -hmm. thought leadership content. Just wanted to make sure that I said that the right way. I didn't want to miss out what you do. You. So that's really cool. And back when I worked at an agency, I was at a content marketing agency for three and a half years. We mm -hmm. had... We hired generalists and then they began to specialize in a given niche. Mm -hmm. However, it takes time to develop that expertise, right? You don't just like specialize in, you know, human resource technology and get it and understand what your CHRO is going through or feels or needs or knows, right? So mm -hmm. I think it's really smart to pair a writer with a subject matter expert. And we had talked about bringing someone in house, like we had talked about does it make sense to hire like a lawyer or a physician just to have that in-house person that we can go to? Because a lot of companies do make their internal subject matter experts available to their writers, but not all of them do. Sometimes they're just too busy. So I think it makes a lot of sense if you can do that to make sure that you're bringing that subject matter expert in-house or hire a subject matter expert to author the content themselves, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's not that huge of an ask to get somebody just on the phone and be like, so what is it that makes this so difficult of a problem? And and how do you really solve this? And like someone can really get into the complexities. If you if you use the model that the agency you're referring to uses, it's I would say it's not going to scale that well. It's not going to succeed tremendously that much. And I think ultimately Ultimately, then the company can be limited, just thinking of it from a, a business model perspective. And the reason I say that is because a generalist certainly will start out creating just general content, and that will not be valuable because there's too much of it. Then they begin to specialize and they get better and they will create better content. But what is really going to bring it from like, you know, what will now, let's say it can become number eight on Google or something. Why does it deserve to be number one? Well, it is possible that person would have to become so interested in what they've learned over the years that they are asking their own questions, challenging their assumptions. It takes a good degree of critical thinking on behalf of this generalist turned specialist to become a true subject matter expert. You know, and I think the culture of like, I have a lot of articles, I got to pump them out kind of thing fights against that. It makes it more difficult to have the space to think and to question what you're reading and the way things are done in the industry and come up with really original content. The people that do have space for that might be someone that's a little bit, that would never write an article, might be an executive or the founder of the company or whoever it may be. And for those people, the only thing that makes sense is to interview them. So mm -hmm. subject matter expert absolutely can work, but it has to be a special one. And then, you know, sometimes interviewing is the right thing. 
Yeah. And something else I talked about pretty recently with my friend, Ashley, who came on the pod is recording everything, right? So if you have this really brilliant subject matter expert that's on the executive team and their profile is really similar to your buyer, Mm -hmm. why don't you record them as much as possible and see how you can take that and translate that into original, unique and compelling and influential content? Oh, I love that concept. Yeah. I think that's uh, that's a very good idea. I haven't thought about uh, exactly that. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, you got to cover all your bases because these people are are really, really busy. And one other thing that I think is pretty interesting that I've seen a few companies start to do more is have an influencer kind of program so that they invite people who they think are either influencers or thought leaders in their space, and they'll invite them to write about whatever they want, as long as it's original and like a fresh take. And mm-hmm. I've seen that do pretty well, although it's not typically aligned with a keyword. They're pay- basically like write about something that's going to interest our audience. And then, right. you know, search is just not a channel for distribution. They'll distribute it in other ways. Have you tried that? Or do you think that that is something worthwhile? Yeah, we've helped clients with that. The thing is, I mean, if it's a true influencer, meaning it's, it's somebody that people trust organically because they've listened to the person they've read the person's writing and they say, well, this person really knows what they're talking about in this area, or I just find this person charismatic or interesting. And they're going to advocate in in a genuine way. That's the whole tough part about this. Mm. It can't feel like an advertisement. That's very, very effective. So I think it works very well, but I think a lot of people end up deciding to spend their, you know, spend part of their budget on influencers. And then it's handed off to somebody that doesn't really get how critical the genuineness piece and the, how do we make an organic connection between the product and the influencer? If you can do all that right, it's a phenomenal channel. That's a great point. Do you have any tips on how you can do all that right? How do you make the connection between the product and the influencer and make sure that the content that they're putting out is really genuine? There's not a formula to it, but what what I will say, even just from an operational standpoint, somebody's job for part of their day around the time that this campaign is being set up needs to be making that connection and then essentially debating it with people saying, does this feel right? Mm. And making sure there's not yes people in the room, but people that are willing to challenge them. I mean, you hear me talk about this subject a lot because it's a really important part of our company is having people that are comfortable challenging and even just being wrong, saying something out loud and being like, would you do that? Yeah, maybe you would, I guess, but at least testing it out. So I think it's more about having the, the time and space to set up that organic connection, have somebody really think about it and then have it stress tested a little bit through Mm. debate. I love that. I love how collaborative you are, how you're talking (laughs) a lot about the importance of carving out space and time and Mm -hmm. being really collaborative because no one person knows it all. And that's ultimately why I want this podcast and why I'm inviting people like you, because I think that you have so much knowledge and expertise to share. And I just wanted to Thank you so much for coming on. But before we hop off, I know we're at time. Any final thoughts about content, SEO, or thought leadership in terms of what people should be doing today or maybe what they're doing wrong that you'd like to share? Sure. It'll make sense with what I've said, but hopefully it'll it'll drive it home more. We're in a, a place, if you think about the era of SEO, we've gone from a place where the formulaic is all that you need. It used to be, you know, you put the keywords you want to rank for in tiny letters at the bottom of your site. Back in 2004, you could rank for it. You buy links that say the keywords you want to rank for in the anchor text, you rank for it. That was a formulaic era. We've become less and less that way and more so into an era of quality. I mean, this mm. is to Google's credit. Google does well as a company when people get quality results. And so you have to adhere to that. You have to play the same game that they're playing. And it also makes you know the whole eco- knowledge ecosystem we're in even better. And so more time spent on articles, thinking about them, thinking about the correct way to f- uh, format the, the data that you're putting forth, making sure that if you have an introduction, for instance, that's just going through the paces and warming you up to get into the content, you just delete that just getting right to the point, to the answer, to the thing the person was searching for and putting it in the most satisfying way possible, answering not just the questions inherent in the searcher's intent, but the questions they didn't even think to ask, but they would find valuable answered anyway. Taking the time to do all that, uh, even if it means fewer pieces of content, is actually going to result in rankings and leads. 
Yeah. And it's a tough mix, right? Cause we hear velocity. You have to definitely publish 20 to 30 articles a month. And then you hear, but right. it has to be good. You have to have it be really amazing. So slow down and produce less. And people, I feel like it's just really hard to find the balance. And I think it's just a matter of getting going, testing and seeing what's working for you and then adjusting from there. Maybe it's not 20 for you. Maybe you can put out really good stuff and you can start to see some success with 10 or 12 pieces per month. Maybe for others, they need to put out hundred articles a month because their articles just aren't as good, right? Really depends. Yeah, it reminds me of the good, fast, cheap, pick yeah. two thing. <laughs> uh, I forget exactly how it's phrased, but yeah, I mean, possibly if you resource it enough, it'll be expensive, uh, but you can do 30 pieces of content a month or whatever, one a day. You can do that. You just need to pay a lot for it because it's a lot of people all involved in a, in a complex process that mm -hmm. all need time to think, to come up with graphics, to come up with the right way of phrasing it, to make a mistake and then try again. All of it's such an organic process as much as there's AI for content nowadays, like that is definitely not what's, you know, ranking on, on Google when you're talking about the real valuable keywords. And that's a topic for another day. Maybe we'll chat yes. in the future again about AI because I would love to talk to you about that too, but we are out of time. So Evan, thank you so much for coming on. This has been an awesome chat. I've really had a good time. My pleasure. And thank you so much for having me on. All right. Great. Have a great day. You too. To find out more about House of Bold, head to houseofbold.com. That's H-A-U-S. And then make sure to subscribe to the Notorious Thought Leader in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. So you never miss an episode. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.